We're going to cover you know, some food for thought on the logistics market, what's happening with investment trends, uh, capital flows, and then the drivers of growth, change, and opportunities across Europe in terms of e-commerce, um, 3D printing, new technology, uh, multimodal, different forms of freight, and how it's changing significantly the way that logistics and manufacturing and production is happening and, and will happen in future. So, first slide is you know, a few lines here in terms of the amount of capital that's now being raised, senior capital, you know, institutional capital going into the logistics market. Um, so we've seen, you know, Norges and Prologis have set up huge JVs, uh, you know, billions, billions of money to engage in the logistics market globally and on a pan-European basis. You know, why is that money moving into logistics? We'll cover shortly, but it's, you know, is logistics the new retail? It is a retail derivative of sorts. You know, we've got increasing global trade. We've got changes in supply chains. So we've got increasing decentralization, which creates buy-side opportunities. There's new markets yet to be tapped. And of course, logistics has always been a good yield play relative to other real estate assets. So if we look at where the uh, transactions have occurred, the big transactions in the last two and a half years or two years since these funds have been setting up. We see some pretty big pan-European institutional deals. So Segro, again, P3, Prologis. Um, the P3 deal is a bit more central and Eastern European. The next big market, which has seen most of the other big deals, is the UK. Then we've got big deals happening in Russia, France, Sweden, Italy and some smaller deals happening in you know, the other kind of core markets, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, and a, you know, a smaller deal in Turkey. So if we look at the way that those deals are translating into total volumes, you know, it, it marries up with where capital is going generally. So it's definitely always going into the UK, to Germany, to France, and to Sweden. If you look at the bars, the, the top half represents capital since 2010. So if you look closely, you'll see there's more capital going into the likes of Russia, Poland, and the Czech Republic, as much as going into all these other markets. And then you, you, know, you have points such as Belgium, where it seems like it's punching below its weight, given that it is a strong core logistics market. So invest, you know, investment flows are definitely going into those markets, which are the main hubs. Um, and this shows the representation of the kind of core distribution hubs across Europe. If we look at what's happened to yields, I think in general we've seen compression in a lot of markets, but not in every market. So yields have compressed in the, the sort of main active markets in and around Heathrow, the M25, Frankfurt, here in Amsterdam, Prague and Warsaw. But we're yet to see any real yield compression in Southern Europe, um, in Paris, in Madrid, Madrid and Milan. And markets such as Athens are still, you know, still to bounce back from their, uh, their pretty significant trough. So there's some yield play opportunities still to be you know, tapped into for investors. But what's also quite interesting is you know, if we look at industrial as a percentage of total volumes over time, even though all this huge money is being raised to get into the sector and is being deployed in the sector, it's still just batting around about the same level, around about 9% of the market. So it suggests that there needs to be a lot more you know, smaller portfolios or other portfolios, other units brought to market to keep the investment flow in logistics going and to satisfy the significant demand that's being raised in terms of capital. I think what's interesting if you look at Central and Eastern Europe in comparison is the extent to which logistics is taking a much bigger chunk of investment flows than other asset types. So that's being driven by you know, pretty big portfolios such as P3 and there are other big deals, other portfolios happening this year. Um, so CTP, are considering selling their portfolio, which is worth 1.6 billion, that will make you know, industrial the biggest sector in the Czech Republic ever uh, for the first time. And there are other transactions, other big portfolios that are ongoing within that market. Now, the other thing that's driving volumes in Eastern Europe is pipelines. Yeah? So it's new demand, new product being built. And I think this is quite significant in terms of where the supply is coming from. So obviously, you know, Moscow is, is way ahead of everywhere, everywhere else. Paris is also pretty big. But if you measure up Western Europe, Eastern Europe, you know, 75% is coming of new supplies coming out through Eastern Europe. So we don't seem to be building enough new logistics space within most parts of Europe. Yeah? And that seems to be an opportunity that we're missing, because new development needs to occur to satisfy new investment demand. 
We've got to churn through the stock that we have. And the other thing about um, increasing pipelines happening in Russia and in Central and Eastern Europe, you know, we're seeing this shift in terms of what's always been termed the, the blue banana, the, the kind of you know, the key distribution points across Europe. So, you know, we've got one banana. We've probably got a second banana that's coming up, and that's going across northern Germany into Poland, Czech Republic, down into uh, the top end of Slovakia. I'm not sure if it's a banana in Russia just yet, but it's definitely evolving around St. Petersburg and Moscow. We can't see it on the map, but uh, our Russian colleague is here. You know, 70 percent of new supply is coming out in other Russian cities further east, and it's following the retail trade. Yeah, it's driven predominantly by retail, so it's, you know, it's increasing even further east of this picture. So we're seeing quite a big change in terms of how distribution is changing across Europe. The other thing that we're seeing is you know, larger deals being done. So demand has shifted from slightly smaller units to bigger units. And again, that's being driven by retail and it's being driven by e-commerce. So if you know, 40,000 square meter deals made up 5% of deals two years ago, they now make up 20% in Eastern Europe. So there's a requirement for much bigger sheds, much bigger modern facilities. Um, you know, as I say, e-commerce, retail, and Amazon in particular are driving this change. You know, and they've evolved significantly in the last 10, 15 years. They've now got new distribution centers in Poland, in Czech Republic. There are plans for more in the Czech Republic. But if you look at the map, you know, it's still very much centralized around these two, two bananas, but there are huge gaps across other parts of Europe. In the Nordics, in Iberia, further east. Um, I mean, Russia is probably not a market Amazon will enter, and Russia has its own e-commerce um, providers that have evolved pretty rapidly. And if we look at the extent to which e-commerce has risen in the last two years, in Eastern Europe, it's gone from 1.9% you know, to 8.4%. It's, it's quadrupled in two years. So it's, it's a significant driver of demand. Uh, last year, we were saying CE is maybe 4% of retail sales are online. To what extent this has pushed retail sales up, we don't know. We're going to need to wait for the figures to come out. But we are rapidly maturing closer towards the kind of UK, US norms of 10 to 15%. So if we go through this initial growth phase, you know, what's next for e-commerce? How does it evolve after that? So this is the Amazon growth curve. Yeah. So what happens next? Does it keep going that way? Does it flatten off? Or does it keep growing? So if there's untapped demand for large regional distribution centers in the markets that we've said there are gaps. In the more mature markets, we're shifting to some forms of, um, sort of hub, and hub and spoke distribution models, click and collect, which is both in-store and in-warehouse. That will probably evolve again to customize click and collect, and this is all driven by new technology and the way that we're purchasing and demanding goods. Um, so we have new companies such as Shapeify where you create a mini me and have all your clothes fitted around that model of yourself. You, know, you can customize your own shoes and this is bringing distribution at that level much closer to the consumer. So it's definitely gonna drive this hub and spoke distribution model. What happens after that? You know, we don't know, it's rapidly evolving, but it's also worth noting that retail is only about 35% of the market. So we've still got significant production and manufacturing, which really drives the Polish market at the moment. You know, and we've got big changes in that with 3D printing. You know, in China, they're now 3D printing houses. I'm not sure I'd want to live in one, but you know, they're already kind of producing these things at significant scale. I think Boeing and GE are now 3D printing components and parts to fit into aircraft and into vehicles. Uh, the University of Utrecht is printing body organs. It's, they implanted their first skull into somebody's head this year. So it's advancing pretty rapidly. At home, it doesn't appear to be working. It's what is called spaghetti and meatballs in the industry, trying to 3D print objects which turn into a Jackson Pollock, basically. That's what it looks like to me. So at home, it's not really working yet but at a major industrial level, it is working and it's evolving quickly. We've also got you know, new robotics. They're much more advanced than they used to be. 
They're also, their entry level price is coming down significantly, and that in time will start to change the way production occurs in terms of you know, SMEs being able to afford to bring in robotics um, to produce more sort of customized goods at a more local level. And that's going to be needed because if we consider where Europe's population is going, you know, our working population is already declining. So robotics are going to be needed, or robots will be needed, rather than wanted to have, as it were. And that's all going to increase automation, and it will increase um, or change the way the supply chain works. Which would happen there. The other one that I just wanted to throw in there is intra or multimodal. So it's the desire and need to shift from road to rail, particularly over longer distances. So if you get over 300 kilometers, it's more cost effective to put things on rail freight. So there's, there's a pretty big gap here where once you get beyond the major ports where goods are coming in, there is an opportunity for intra multimodal hubs to be built and for logistics to be built around those facilities. And if you look at what Prologis has done in the UK in terms of building its strategic um, rail freight interchanges, that's something that's you know, rapidly evolved there and it is something else that we'll start to see across the rest of Europe in due course. So big changes on the supply chain, big opportunities, um, an interesting discussion, food for thought in terms of what's driving the market.